welcome to Women Positively Aging, the podcast show for women in midlife and older who want to live well for longer. I'm your host, Barbara Bray, registered nutritionist and PhD researcher in healthy aging diets. And today's episode is Move More and Age Well. The average health span, that's the number of years that people spend healthy in the UK, is about 10 years shorter than the average lifespan. Increasing the number of years that we spend in good health is a priority, not just for us as individuals, but for our wider society. Health is determined by a range of different things in our environment, and physical activity is just one of those. As we age, our muscle mass and strength decreases and our body fat increases. Physical activity, particularly strengthening exercises, are recommended to maintain fitness. There are also added benefits to this, such as balance, flexibility and endurance, which means that we're less likely to fall as we age. My guests today are Shaney Rowley smith Head of System Organisational Development, Leadership and Wellbeing, working across the whole public service system in Greater Manchester, and Hayley Lever, the Greater Manchester Moving Exec Lead and CEO of Greater Sport. Welcome to the show, Shaney and Hayley, and thank you so much for your time. And I'm sure if anyone could get us moving more, it's going to be the two of you. So I'd like to start with, with Hayley and to talk about the impact of physical activity. So if you can give us some examples of your work in women in sport, and, and this girl can, to share with us. So I think you've, you've talked really clearly there about the kind of benefits um, already in your introduction about in, the impact of physical activity on people's lives um, throughout our life course from early years to older age. But um, in the context of, of active ageing, uh, there were so many benefits and there's lots and lots of evidence I could point you to from all sorts of sources around the, both the physical and the mental wellbeing benefits of movement and physical activity and sport. Um, and the social benefits. Uh, so there's very there's a there's a whole heap of um, of benefits that we feel, and they're both short term. Like they can be immediate, you know. So think about the mental health benefits in a stressful day, where you just take a step outside and go for a walk around the block and breathe and notice nature or the weather or you know. So the the, the benefits can be immediate as well as long term. So physical activity as we get older will help us to. Um, prevent the onset of long-term conditions, it will help us to live with long-term conditions that we might already be experiencing, and it will help us to recover from different conditions and um, perhaps injuries or things that we might experience as we get older as well. So there's a kind of a, a prevention of living with and recovery from um, injury or, or a long-term condition. Uh, you mentioned strength and balance and flexibility becomes more and more important as you get older, uh, both for men and women, but in particular for, for women and around the sort of perimenopause, menopause, later and onwards around um, maintaining bone density, strength, flexibility, uh, ultimately in the long run, preventing um, falls, you know, reducing our risks of falling because falling is massively correlated with other, um, you know, other challenges as well. So there's a lot of the work that we do um, around active ageing and we talk about, you know, ageing really from sort of early 50s onwards, um, so half your life probably. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, we're ageing from the day we're born, aren't we? So I think a lot of what we do is to, um, really kind of challenge some of the myths that are quite ageist, you know, in terms of like, as we get older, we can live full, happy, active, rewarding, productive, you know, joyful lives. And, and physical activity and movement is such an you know, important ingredient of creating the physical and mental conditions in which we can be, you know, productive, uh, with so many social benefits um a lot of women um really enjoy the kind of social side of getting active with friends and family um and, and it being a you know an important part of the fabric of their day-to-day -day lives um also in terms of uh how we show up at work you know being positive productive um reducing the risk of us uh being off work due to ill health there's a huge um, body of evidence growing around the menopause and about how important physical activity and movement is to both sort of live with the symptoms that many women experience during menopause and really help to manage the mental and physical impacts that menopause brings. So, so there's, it's all good. <laughs> move more every day. It's all good. We all need to move more. But there are particular things as we get older 
uh, that become more and more kind of um, important um, in various different ways. And thanks for that comprehensive explanation. And there's a couple of things that I wanted to pick out on that. So you talked about physical activity, but you also talked about movement, because I guess there'll be people who haven't really understood the difference between physical activity, movement and exercise. Can you just clarify that for us before we go on in, into this in more depth? Yeah, and I think that's an important thing to clarify, really, because we know from, you know, really deep insight and work that, you know, this girl can and women in sport and others have done, that there are um, perceptions and kind of mental barriers that inhibit women from engaging in an active life. And some of them are to do with long held experiences of peeing in school or uh, feeling excluded or not feeling welcome in particular activities as, they, as they've grown up. And so... One of the things that we're working really hard on is shifting the language. Some people are fearful or put off by the language of sport or exercise. For some people, that's a really positive association. Like, can't wait to, to do more exercise, to be, you know, to be sporty. If you've had a really positive experience and you're deeply held sort of um, sense of enjoying being active um, and, and playing sport and exercise, then that's fine. But there's a whole, you know, lots and lots of women across the life course who who don't have those positive associations um, and that think that, that an active life is something you have to wear special clothes for, go to organised and structured sessions for and, you know, pay to do. And there's all these things that sort of are then in the way for, for some people. Um, so, so a big part of the culture shift that we're trying to kind of drive and create the conditions for is recognising that any movement is good for most, unless you've got a small number of conditions which for which you know being more active and exercising isn't um always helpful but there are tiny you know a number of conditions that you that might apply that you have to be a bit careful around but for the vast majority of people and the vast majority of um, life situations moving more every day is the best medicine um, for physical and mental well-being and so the shift of language to moving rather than necessarily physical activity, exercise or sport makes it much more inclusive. It then opens up a whole world of possibilities like actually just moving to do your housework, gardening, dancing, walking the dog. A lot of people over the years have told us through the kind of work we've done, it's like they want to know where does that count? You know, does it count if I just walk the dog? And does it count if I'm dancing with my kids in the kitchen? And so, yes, it all counts. Any any movement is good. There are some aspects that um, to really get the health benefits, uh, you know, we do need to get our heart rate up and we do need to build that strength. But it doesn't have to be in a hardcore boot camp down the gym is the point. So we're just trying to shift mindsets and beliefs and understanding of what movement can be um, to make it more inclusive it's something that we it's about designing and moving back into life and then once we have an active nation you know an active people some of those people will want to then engage in structured um, more formalized sport and exercise and that's brilliant um, you know but it's not for everybody we recognize that Oh, that's great. So it really sets out the scene. So it's about being inclusive and helping people to understand that doing something is better than doing nothing. So that's helpful. Thank you. And I'd like to move on to Shane because she's definitely somebody who does do a lot of movement. And I actually know her through my own gym. So when I was living in Manchester, I went to a gym and I remember standing next to her in day one and realising that she could actually deadlift my own body weight, which raised an eyebrow or two, given that she's way shorter than me. <laughs> so the fact that I can't lift my own body weight... <laughs> Maybe being even worse. But Shaney, I want to talk to you a little bit about how what your journey was, how you ended up doing strength training. If you could share some of that with us and the impact it's had on you. I hadn't actually realised that I was lifting your body weight, but that's uh, that's made me smile a lot. So thanks for that, Barbara. Um, so I suppose um, just like a lot of young women, um, I didn't really think about my, my physical fitness. I didn't really think about uh, where I was up to in my 20s, kind of coming out of school, which for me, you know, going to school in the 80s wasn't great. You were segregated um, for all sorts of reasons, you know, the way that you kind of did your PE, what the expectations, all sorts of things. So, um, you know, I went out dancing and I did climbing and I ran and I did all sorts of different things. And I had a really active work life as well. So my physical and my emotional fitness was just there. And I didn't really think about it. It wasn't really until I hit my 30s and I entered motherhood and I was, I'm, I'm still a working mum. 
Um, I started to perhaps not put myself first um, in in day-to-day life because my kids came first, work came first. Um, And I almost got to a point where I realised I needed to make a change. Um, My body shape had changed, my weight had changed, my expectations of myself had changed as well, actually. Um, And I wasn't really engaging in the social aspects of what really kept me physically and emotionally well as much because I was so busy running around you know, responding to the to the physical and the mental labour of, of of delivering life, I suppose. Um, and so it all kind of started when I realised I was probably at the beginning of my perimenopausal journey, which I'm still on at the moment. Um, I was drained, I was tired, um, and I just needed to make a change. So I returned to the things that I knew already. Um, I, I danced in my kitchen, um, I walked, um, I went back to yoga. So I used to do yoga a lot, which gave me flexibility and realised that I wasn't as flexible as I used to be, especially my, my hip health as well. Kind of my, my hip flexibility kind of had completely gone after I'd had children. Um, and I really kind of just wanted to do things that I enjoyed because I knew that if I pushed myself too hard and made myself do things, they weren't sustainable changes. So I I was on a long term journey um, and I'm still on that journey, actually, as well. Um, So really focused on my motivation and my enjoyment as opposed to the gains that I was getting. Um, I am competitive, but I'm actually more competitive with myself than with anyone else. Um, So it it was about my progression um, and what I put into place. And I slowly just ended up recognising all the different things that had changed that I hadn't really thought about in my 20s um, that I needed to address as I entered middle age. Um, And I actually started doing some strength training as a way of raising money for a charity, a women's charity. Um, And somebody suggested, well, why don't we do, why don't we do some deadlifts? See how many deadlifts we can do, a sponsored deadlift. Um, And I thought, yeah, I I can do that. I can probably lift about, I don't know, a thousand kilos in about an hour. So if you you kind of break it down in your head and set all these things up. So went along, got sponsored by loads of people. um, And there were 30 of us doing this. So the camaraderie of this is incredibly important. Um, And I surprised myself because I lifted six and a half thousand kilos in an hour. So that was 65 kilos in sets of 10. Oh, my word. So when you start breaking it down, all of a sudden I realised that actually I was limiting my own ability to be able to do things because I pushed myself that day and I really kind of went for it. Um, And I absolutely love the adrenaline buzz that I got from doing strength training. So I've carried on. So that was about 18 months ago. Um, So I'm still here doing it. I absolutely love it. Um, I was there this morning. Um, and it and it does really feed my physical and my mental well-being. And for me, it's about an investment in me. Um, and it's about an investment in the time that I need to protect for myself. As I'm absolutely firmly kind of entering middle age, I am perimenopausal, um, the physical and the emotional shifts and changes and the expectations, not only that I have of myself, but that society has of me as well, in terms of the way that we look and the way that we kind of hold ourselves in public and the way that we um, behave in, in the workplace have all shifted. So there is a level of ageism. I know that Haley's just kind of mentioned that. I think that's really, really important. For me, the other aspect that's really kind of kept me engaged is um, about being creative with my journey as well. Doing the same thing week in, week out, day in, day out is not good. So um, as Haley's described, you know, it's all sorts of different things. So uh, lockdown was interesting. Lots of kitchen discos, lots of walking. Yeah, I saw more people walking out there than anything. And actually, there was a real enjoyment in that. Um and you just kind of have to have the, the the guts to just try different things. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So I did Brazilian dancing for a little while. Um, and it was nothing more than just a group of friends who got together um, and just listened to some music and, and did a little bit of dancing, a little bit of capoeira-based dancing. So um, I didn't stick with it, but I absolutely loved it. And it kind of got me into the next stage of whatever it, whatever it was that I wanted to do. So it's a journey and you kind of have to commit not to the journey, but to yourself to take part in the journey, I would suggest. That's really helpful. And again, there's something in what you said that, that's triggered another thought in my head. And that's really about the, the change that you've seen. So you talked about how we're perceived in society as we enter middle age and come through. Would you say that the, the doing the exercise helped you look at yourself differently, which then helped you see yourself through better eyes? Or do you think it's the fact that you were just aging and maturing that made you kind of think, oh, I need to let some stuff go? Which came first? Was it chicken or egg? 
I don't know. I don't know about the maturity. I don't know if that's there anyway. Um, <laughs> I think, and it's certainly not about other people's perceptions of me. It's about my perception of myself, the way I felt confident enough to move through physical spaces, public spaces, oh, how I okay. held myself, my posture, um, how I felt about myself, really, really important. Um, and that's really only come through just turning up every single day when I do some, 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 something physical and you just do it, even though you might not feel like it, um, just really committing to it helps on a day-to-day -day basis. And I like that because it's almost like we're talking about marginal gains. So it's the fact that you're embedding a habit and you, you've got that background knowledge that there's a reason why you do this. You've got your why. So it doesn't matter the output. So whether you can deadlift more than my body weight or not is irrelevant. It's the fact that you've turned up, you've shown up, whether it's, you know, 30 degrees outside or whatever, and you've been able to do that. And that's probably a good point for me to bring Hayley back in and, and talk about motivation because when you've been working with the various groups that you do, Hayley, have you seen, uh, have you been able to work out lots of different types of motivation for different people? Because we're not all the same. So how you might manage to effectively get a, a whole group of different people to suddenly find their why and the importance and the focus on moving more? Yeah, no, I think that's such an important point. And um, yeah, something that Shani said really resonated with me, the physical and mental impact of delivering life. Isn't that just describing how it can feel sometimes, especially the last few years, I think, um, through the pandemic, but the, identifying why. So um, I, I read uh, James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, recently, and it really resonated and reaffirmed and, and gave me a language to describe some of the things that we've learned, I've learned over my career and in, in this work. Um, and I think what Shirley talked about there is about identity. So he talks about identity driven sort of habits. Um, so we often don't, you know, we talk about you know, New Year's resolutions, all those kinds of things. Often the desire for change is brought about by externally imposed, um, you know, ideas of what we should look like or how we could be, or it's a new year and I want to change things. Um, there's something about uh, Jenny described there really clearly, an identity you held, you know, there, which was of an active person who enjoyed being active and living an active life that you somehow lost along the way as, as a mum in your 30s and then re-found, it sounded like to me, like you reclaiming your identity as someone who is active and lives a you know an active, healthy life, not only to help to deliver life, but also to bring joy, it sounded like to bring the joy back into life. And I think, you know, what, what Atomic Habits reminded me of is that if we can't find a why that really sticky, you know, that, that really matters to us, then that's where we fall off the wagon in terms of like New Year's resolutions and things. Um, and, he t and he uses this phrase, which I just think is brilliant, is that he, he, I'll put it into a more positive language. He talks about where we fail, but actually I think where we succeed uh, in his language, where we succeed uh, in our ambitions and, you know, sort of in our ambitions to live an active life is, is by designing it in. So Shane said, like, every day I do this. It's just a part of what I do. It's part of my routine. Um, I know it. You know, so we succeed when we design it into our life systems and our processes. We don't succeed by saying, oh, I'm going to lose three stone by December or I'm going to run a marathon in September. That marathon, he talks about, won't happen if you don't design training <laughs> into every single day. And I just think it's so powerful. And the way he helps you to think about it is tiny, tiny changes, but the, but they do need to be routine and designed in. Um, and I think that the question you started with about, you know, what are people's motivations? Um, that's where I think we sometimes sort of fall at the first hurdle is because the motivation we think we're driving for isn't the thing that really deeply matters to us in the end. Because identity and belonging and family and a sense of joy in life a much more sticky, I think, you know, motivations than, you know, I want to lose six pounds or whatever. You think that's the goal, but actually that's not the value of an active life isn't always about how many pounds you lose. So I think, you know, there's there's a load of evidence again about him from this girl can was so powerful when it first kind of the first lot of research that they did around this girl can with Sport England was the fear of judgment. 
and how that how much that was a barrier to people engaging in sport, physical activity, exercise. If you think about those two kind of, you know, there's a fear of judgment and yet there's a desire or a perceived motivation that comes from wanting to look a certain way or wanting to weigh a certain amount and things. And, and it just feels to me like they're, they're incongruent and you, you're kind of fighting a losing battle if you don't feel, if you feel a fear of judgment and you don't feel like you belong and, and have an identity that is of an active person and yet you have a goal which is to live better eat better you know move more so so i just think there's a lot of there's a lot of power in like getting to, to a deeper level of thinking with ourselves about what do we really care about what drives us when we get up every day and then how do we design moving in to be part of that part of that life uh, on it forever you know not just yeah. for the next three months or for the next holiday in the bikini body and all that stuff which is quite superficial in the end um so yeah so i think there's, lo- there's loads there's loads of again brilliant research out there that kind of unpicks all of this but i think shenny described it really well in her story definitely it's a lot easier for people to appreciate when you see it in one person's example but again i always try and stress to everybody that we're all different so it's about finding our way and i did enjoy looking at that this girl campaign was it two, three years ago with the pandemic? You always forget how long stuff has actually been. But um, just seeing those adverts, even on a day where you felt a bit kind of, uh, you'd see that this girl can flash up. And I actually put it in my um, utility room on the wall. I printed it off in large letters and stuck it on the wall because there were days when, you know, I'd be like, oh, we're going to go for a walk today. Then I'd go in, put some laundry on, or go in and get, I don't know, the mop for the floor. And I'd see that this girl kind of be like, okay, I'm on it. And even though I wasn't seeing other people out and moving, especially during the pandemic it was too easy to kind of sit inside it's little things that motivate you because you've committed to saying I'm going to walk to the shop or I'm going to walk and do x and designing it in is so important and even when I picked my last place to live I wanted it to be at least 20 to 30 minutes walk from the office deliberately because I knew that that's the only way that I couldn't cheat on myself I couldn't pretend that it didn't matter because I had to go to the office so you know I couldn't have a day where I kind of went oh I'm really not bothered every day I had to do that 20 to 30 minute walk and it wasn't a hardship it wasn't a stress it was just a matter of fact that I need to get from A to B so I think designing things in it's it's very much the same way that we look at having a good relationship with food as well if you design it in and it makes the choices a lot easier because they're already there so I think that motivation piece is huge and Shaney were you going to jump in and and say something on that yeah I was just what both you and Hayley were talking about just just triggered some thoughts we don't have a society that values women being active you know from the um, role models and the images that we see that are constantly airbrushed the level of sports gear and equipment to help us feel supported, contained, sweat free, wick free, you know, whatever it might be. Um, they come in very limited sizes. Um, so if you're a bigger woman, then it's harder and more expensive to get access to things. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to wear really expensive gear, but actually there is something around um, the, the subliminal messages that we all get um, around uh, whether we are able to or deserve to be active and be seen in public being active. So I absolutely love that this girl, the girl can. It wasn't just about women doing th- things. It was about women of all all shapes, colours and sizes doing things. And that the power of that and the role modelling of that is incredibly important, actually, not only for, for us who are of a particular age, but actually to to our to the young women in our society as well, that actually it's OK and it's it's good for you to participate. Um, you know, the, I know the statistics kind of show that when girls move from primary to secondary school, that's one of the key points where um, young girls kind of stop participating in group activities and group sports. Um, some do, depends what environment you're in. But there, there is something about the messages that we need to send out really loudly and clearly. So, um, you know, I, I, I will I will go to the supermarket looking a little bit sweaty. Sorry, everyone. But, you know, it's, imp- it's important that you're there and then you're kind of just, you know, doing day to day life um, because that's the reality of 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 embedding it in your life, that it is sustainable. You have to put it into a day to day kind of picture. So. That's some brilliant advice. It's, it's helping us move away from this kind of short term goal that we'll fail at and just designing something in that's accessible that we're just going to do every day. And those small wins are so important because accumulatively, they're so very good for us and helping us with our overall health. And I'm sure it, it, it 
bleeds out into other aspects of life because if you can do that if you you know you can go for a walk or if you can go and include a bit of exercise before you go to the supermarket and fit it into the, the parts of your day where you are free then I'm sure you're able to master other things and like you were saying Jane it helps you with your confidence that I've got this because let's face it during the pandemic I'm sure there are all days when we thought we didn't have it <laughs> And even now as we come out of it, there's still a little bit of, of doubt there. But some days you just got to look in the mirror and say, I've got this. And the fact is you've been able to go and sweep around the backyard is all you're going to do. But you've done that and that's helped you get out and do something. So I think that is important, how we design those, those small wins into the day. And I'd now like to go back and, and retouch on what we talked about regarding menopause, because I know, Hayley, you've written a blog on menopause and exercise. I just want to tease out some, some bit more of the information on that. And I'll also point listeners to it on the show notes for the, for the podcast. So, yeah, I mean, it's been amazing the last few years, just how much um, the conversation about menopause is becoming more normalised and acceptable. Um, not everywhere. I'm not there yet. I'm not suggesting we are, but it's, um, you know, ha- you know, enabled and support, you know, helped by Davina McCall programs on the TV and all sorts of things. There's been a massive shift in the last couple of years about um, about menopause and a growing conversation in, in kind of my work about the role of physical activity and movement and sport in helping uh, helping us to deal with the symptoms associated that with all sort of range of symptoms that people can experience as they're in perimenopause and menopause a recognition that this isn't just something i think i grew up thinking it just took a couple of years and then that was it (laughs) and then we know that it can be you know a 10 year span of time so the idea that you just kind of just get through a couple of years and then you come out the other side and you can crack on with life again i think has been that myth has been busted uh, which is really helpful because I know in my personal experience and the data and the stories um, show it just about how people have been grappling with um, a whole range of physical symptoms, mental health symptoms around anxiety and paranoia and sleeplessness and you know, loss of confidence at work, as well as, you know, all of the, the only things I grew up knowing about, you know, hot flushes and, and all that kind of thing. So I think it, the conversation has opened up massively, which is great. Um, and in that conversation is more and more evidence and um, advice and support around the, the, the how how moving more can help in, in the immediate. I mean, it goes back to that point about it can help immediately. Um, I swim, I go cold water swimming, wild swimming. The number of women um, in that sort of menopausal age range who are in the water <laughs> these last couple of years is phenomenal. It's grown phenomenally. <laughs> because, you know, it's just, it's now we can talk about the fact that what it does for your mental health to swim in co- in cold water and out in nature, um, you know, it can be quite meditative, but also it fundamentally like cools down your core body temperature. So, you know, I've got a whole bunch of friends who are messaging, I need to swim now. <laughs> you know, it is that immediate. Um, I will feel better. You know, there's no question you'll feel better. Um, obviously, do it safely and all of that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, there is just so much more evidence growing anecdotally and um, in the research about the impact. And, and going back to where we started as well about bone health and flexibility and strength. Um, again, you know, busting some myths and helping to change language and imagery around ageing and what that means. But there are some things, no question, there are some things we need to take better care of as we get older. Um, the falls prevention work we've been doing across Greater Manchester is growing all the time and is huge, hugely important. But, and, but I guess I was just chuckling the other day because a friend of mine, we had this conversation. Um, she'd fallen over while she was out running, but she had to clarify, I didn't have a fall. I fell over. You know, I'm not old. I didn't fall over because I'm an old middle aged woman. You know, and, it's, and it really made me laugh. But I think it says a lot, doesn't it, about <laughs> it as does. we get older, when women fall over, as they get older, they have a fall. Whereas <laughs> when you're younger, you just tripped over a stone or whatever. And I think, you know, Jenny's mentioned a couple of times just how our language and about some of the kind of, um, yeah, the ageist attitudes that are out there. So, yes, we need to build bone health, strength, flexibility. We need to pay attention to that. We need to absolutely work on that. But let's do it from a really, like, positive ageing mindset and perspective and let's have language around it that's positive. Um, And it's not just about reduced frailty and, you know, 
So I think that, that feels really important. What I did with the blog, um, so back in January, uh, we did a session uh, for the health and care workforce around menopause and physical activity. And, um, you know, I was at pains to kind of point out, I'm no expert here, you know, on menopause, but what I do know and what I can see and what I managed to gather in in the preparation for to, to doing that webinar was... Um, was a whole heap of evidence out there, but also people's stories. And there's like a lot now resources. Um, there's TV programs, there's podcasts, there's articles that can really help to explain how moving helps you during different phases of the menopause and different symptoms you might have, and also how um, you know how important that is. But it also goes back to our previous conversation about in a way that works for you. Because what came through really clearly is that no people's experience of menopause is the same either. And there were people who were actually, there was a woman on the webinar who's a very sporty woman throughout her life. But actually what she's recognized and finally learned is while she's going through menopause, she's actually changed her sport and exercise habits um, because she's been so impacted in terms of level of fatigue and anxiety and mental health issues that what she realizes now is what the, the best thing she can do at the moment is yoga you know, and um, lower impact, more restorative forms of exercise to build strength and all of that, but actually to deal with stress. So she's learned the hard way that actually running around on a hockey pitch or, you know, doing playing football and all the things that she perhaps used to enjoy aren't really what her body and mind needs right now. So I think Cheney's point about this is a really personalised thing. Our experiences are different. And in terms of my work, the what we need is to create the conditions with safe spaces, nice places for women to go outside and feel safe and be able to walk around in their communities, you know, to be able to swim safely in cold water if that's what they want, um, <laughs> and also clubs and activities and structured um, exercise offers that pays attention to women's menopausal experiences. And there's some brilliant examples of where people are really starting to do that bespoke, well-supported, small group exercise which has a conversation around it, around menopause as well, because the other thing is people need to share their experiences and feel like they're not alone and know that it's normal. So there's whole, you know, there's a massive positive shift and we've got a long way to go, but I think it's really encouraging. Yeah, that sounds really good. And yeah, I'm also a big fan of swimming in cold water. So I'm not enjoying the, the heat of the summer because the water temperature actually is going up too. <laughs> it's better when it's five degrees. <laughs> but thank you. That's really important to help us wrap up some of the information around menopause and help us to understand that it is completely different for individual people. So having somebody say, oh, well, go and go for a swim is just not helpful. Or, you know, somebody say you have to go running. It's all about finding what's right for you. And I think that's something we've taken through the thread of this conversation. So as I end, I'd just like to go back to Shani. Is there anything you want as a take-home message for everybody before we come to a close? Yeah, I'm 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 less of a wild swimmer and more of a um a kind of a paddler. <laughs> that makes <laughs> sense. But yeah, the ben the benefits of kind of cooling that body from the core are really important. Um I think my takeaway messages really would be threefold. The first one is find something you love and just go for it. Um, it's not about the gains, it's about the experience. Um, the second will be just pay a little bit of attention to the impact that it's having on you. So again, this isn't about weight loss, et cetera, et cetera. It might be about improved sleep. It might be about improvement in your relationships with the people around you. Um, it might be about more clarity of mind, um, dealing with frustration. So, you know, the, the ripples of the physical activity are huge and really kind of uh, well known. Um, and it will be different for different people. Um, and I suppose the third thing I would really recommend that people do, um, I one of the things that I've done over the last five or six years is I've, I've consciously learned how to breathe again, which sounds really silly, but actually I realised that I was breathing really shallowly from my chest. We tend to do this as adults, and if you ever watch a baby sleeping, they, you know, they breathe from their belly and they're really rested. And, um, and I realised that actually I was breathing really shallowly and some of my yoga practice kind of really helped me focus on some of that. Um, and so every day I practice deep belly breathing. It's really, really simple, taking, taking that breath right down into your belly and then expelling as much of it as you can. And that helps in all sorts of ways. It helps with uh, bringing fresh oxygen into your body. It helps with the kind of psychological mindset. Um, it helps when you're struggling to find clarity um, and whether you, you know, you've got lots of things kind of coming at you at the same time and you're frustrated or um, you're just a little bit overwhelmed. Um, 
response. So yeah, learning how to breathe consciously as an adult, uh, as a as a perimenopausal middle aged woman, has been really really helpful for me. So I would encourage everyone to give it a go. That's some great advice. Thank you very much, Shani. And Haley, any last words from you? Yeah, I think the, the the main thing I would sort of finish with is is about what's just happened to me there, actually, because Shani's just reminded me that I need to get back to yoga. <laughs> so it's the nudge. I haven't been to yoga since pre-pandemic, um, and I really actually need to get back to yoga. And it hadn't even occurred to me until I heard you talking about that. So thank you, thanks for that. And that takes me to the point I was going to make, which was the thing, the, the most powerful thing that keeps me active every day is a messenger group. Right. So it's not a big initiative or a big sort of campaign or it's not a you know a service delivered by anybody. It's messenger group with a bunch of my friends where I live. And every day somebody will say either at the beginning of the work in the, or the night before or at the end of the day, I'm just going up the hill. I'm just going to walk the dog. I'm just going for short runs. Somebody wants to come. And if I didn't have that group, I wouldn't be probably half as active as I am. Um, so sometimes the smallest things can make, you know, the biggest difference to our everyday habits because that nudge is there constantly, even when you're just finishing work at the end of the day and you're exhausted and you think, no, I can't. You, the idea that you're actually going to go out with a friend and you can have a bit of a yarn and have a nice time, um, it makes it appealing, you know, it make, and you know you're going to feel better after. So same thing with the swimming. Um, we've got a WhatsApp group for the swimming people and that's what that's why you go. So I think... It goes back to the habits. Yeah, how do you design it in? You design it in with some really simple tools as well. Um, and I think that's you know, really important. And that might be through work colleagues. And there's a whole culture shift we need around the working day and, and kind of active at work and in work um, environments. It might be friends or it might be family or it might be a bit of all three of those. It probably is for me, a bit of all three of those nudges that come from every direction in some way. But are all, going back to what Shady says, they all bring me joy. They don't, it doesn't feel like a chore. You know, if it feels like a chore, we're not going to do it as often, are we? So so let's find the, you know, the pleasure and the joy and the social connection, all the headspace and the time to yourself. You know, all the benefits that, you know, I get different benefits at different times. Sometimes I need to be by myself. Sometimes I want to be with a group. Sometimes it's just me and the dog. You know, so it's personalized, it's nudges, it's building in habits and it's making it a really positive thing that you want to get up and do every day because it brings you that joy and yeah, that's my parting advice. <laughs> Brilliant advice. It's been a real pleasure to have both of you on the show today. I've learned quite a bit, actually. Some things, fortunately, I was doing anyway, so that's always a bit of a win, isn't it, when you realise that you are on the right path. So I'm really grateful to both of you for joining us today. And I think what we've heard is about making sure that people are true to themselves and they find something that works for them and find something that is sustainable, because we want to live healthy lives not just a long life you want to live well for longer so what we said today really just talk to the title of the podcast so that was move more age well episode i hope everyone's enjoyed listening please do follow or subscribe depending on what platform you're listening to so you'll find out the next one we will be taking a short break over the summer and coming back in september where we'll be hearing about brain health loneliness and isolation and also heart health so do join me after the break stay well in the meantime and take care thank you